Much like boating, where everything is trying to kill you all of the time, in astrophotography, we have a multitude of factors that are conspiring against us during an imaging session to ruin our subs. Today we're going to talk about why last night, on one of the clearest nights I had here in a long time, I only got about three hours of good subs out of six hours of total imaging time. But to talk about that, I'm going to bring you down to the boat. Let's go. Now TV 14, that means children under 14 probably shouldn't watch this because of strong violence and some sexual content. Here we are in someone's boat. I want you to think about an onion. Three fingers, one in front, two behind. Today what we're going to be talking about are the four most influential factors that affect us as astrophotographers, starting at the outer layer of the onion and working our way in. Those four layers are at the outer edge, space, then the Earth's atmosphere, then our own equipment, and lastly at the center, us as the imager. First, let's start with the outer layer of the onion. There are two things I want to talk about with regards to space. The first is object selection, be it a deep sky object like a galaxy or nebula, or a planetary target or something like a comet. The time of the month and indeed the time of the year are important because what's in the night sky changes as time progresses across the year. Targets that are visible in winter won't be visible in summer. At the moment, the Heart and Soul Nebula are on their way up. And just up and down, up and down. It feels and sounds a little bit weird. Through about 30, 40 degrees of altitude. The next factor is the moon. As the month progresses, the moon phase changes. As a narrowband imager, I can get away with shooting two of my channels, sulfur 2 and hydrogen alpha, even when the moon is at its strongest, I still get good results due to blocking out a lot of light pollution, rejecting that light from the moon. However, the oxygen 3 channel is susceptible to light pollution from the moon. So ideally, you would want to structure your target so that you're shooting O3 when the moon is at its weakest. That is, a few days either side of the new moon. The next layer in is Earth's atmosphere, and it's conspiring against us all of the time. Things like cloud, wind, humidity, atmospheric turbulence, aircraft, aircraft contrails. It looks like a can of dog food. It's like a fucking flip-flop. Looks like a bison's tongue. It's like someone's pissed in my soup. We don't have control over any of those things, yet they're there and they do affect our imaging sessions. The best that we can hope to do is have an awareness that they are affecting us so that when we're doing our imaging session and we see subs coming in that are less than ideal, we understand why that's happening. What the fuck is going on? Moving on now to the next layer in, and that's our own equipment. The other night I had really accurate guiding, 0 0.65, 0 0.7 RMS, which for wide field imaging is perfect. However, I was still getting star trails and I couldn't figure out why. In the end, it was going to be either one of two things something called differential flexure or fan vibrations from the fan inside the camera. So I took some steps to try and eliminate flexure by making sure that the guide camera and guide scope were perfectly aligned with the main telescope and applied a plug-in in Nina to do some flexure correction. It worked for a while, but then the issue came back. I replaced the fan inside the camera. It's quite amazing actually when you think about it, the fact that these cameras can cost 1800 pounds and have a 50 pence fan in there. Last night when I imaged after the fan replacement, no more star trails. But that issue actually ended up costing me on the first night that it was happening, about three hours of solid imaging time. Another issue that can really affect you depending on where you live is dew, which is related to humidity. I live in a very humid area. Typically when I image, it's anywhere from 90 to 95% humidity. Temperatures at the moment down around 17 degrees Celsius with a dew point at 15 or 16. So that dew point's within about a degree or two of my actual ambient temperature. So I have to be very careful if I want to run my camera at minus 10 degrees Celsius, which I do, that I've got my dew situation under control. But when I was starting out, I didn't fully appreciate that if I did want to run at minus 10, the fact that I was still going to get dew on the camera sensor, despite that camera having an AR heater in it. So I was very surprised the first night that I tried minus 10 degrees Celsius to see dew showing up as a white hazy ring in my subs. What I ended up having to do was buy a separate RCA dew heater ring that plugs into my power box, is now glued to the front of my camera to apply some extra heat to the front there. And now I can image at minus 10 degrees Celsius in 95% humidity and not get any dew issues. The first time that happens to you and you don't have that dew heating ring with you, you are forced to image at a warmer camera sensor temperature than you would like. You want to make sure that the temperature that you pick is going to be colder than the coldest night in winter. 
but also within limits for summertime. It can be 25 degrees Celsius at night and the camera manufacturer says that the camera is good down to 35 degrees Celsius below ambient, i.e. minus 10. So minus 10 for me is good in summer because it doesn't really get any warmer than 25 degrees Celsius at night. And then in winter time, it doesn't really get any colder than about minus five at a stretch. And so now at the center of our onion is us. Knowledge, skill, and experience level. And that's perhaps the most critical thing here because it's the thing that we have the most control over. What I would say and what I'm discovering for myself at the moment is that it's best to keep it simple. Last night was one of the clearest nights I've had in a long time and I was fully expecting at least five hours of solid good subs out of last night. What I ended up getting instead was about three. And the reason that happened was because I was trying to do too much with the imaging session. Over the past few weeks, I'd gotten into my head that one of the best things I could have done with mono imaging would be to change filters regularly during the imaging session so that across the night, I was getting equal amounts of information on every filter. I've since ditched that idea as of last night. I think it's counterproductive because it's trying to achieve too much and it's introducing complexities that just don't need to be there. For example, at the moment, the, we the moon state is weak. So what I decided to do was just use the entire night for O3, which is not what I'll be able to do when the moon is stronger. Later on in the month when the moon's stronger, I can get away with shooting S2 and hydrogen alpha. But right now, it's ideal to shoot O3. So I may as well maximize that time and get as much O3 data in it as I can. One of the benefits of sticking with one filter for a protracted amount of time across your imaging session is that you're not losing time to repeated autofocus routines. The autofocus routine will only run when the temperature changes a significant amount. You can get around this with filter offsets. However, that's another layer of complexity that you don't necessarily need to contend with. Instead, what you can do is across multiple nights, just shoot a single filter per night. O3 one night, S2 another night, hydrogen alpha on another night. The imaging session is then much more stable. At the center of the onion, one of the most important things that we can put time into is becoming more comfortable with the software that we're using when we image and process. And there's a multitude of different programs that you could be using. If you're in the ZWO ecosystem, that's largely taken care of for you. However, if you go down the blue road with Nina, then much like your own equipment setup is bespoke and nobody can really help you with it because you built it yourself. With regards to software and the routines that you set up, they have to work for your equipment in your situation. And that's something that only you can know and figure out for yourself through trial and error. It takes time. It's not something that you're going to be an ace at in six months. Best thing I can do at the moment is just try and improve every single imaging session. If I had an issue one imaging session, try and understand what went wrong, what caused that so that it doesn't repeat and then I'm not carrying my errors through for weeks or months at a time. An example of that is three-point polar alignment in Nina. At the moment, I'm finding that depending on where I do three-point polar alignment, the solution can then degrade by up to 10 minutes accuracy and I need to rerun it. Whereas what might be better to do is run the routine two or three times at the start of the night, make sure it's stable, but do that in the region of sky where I'm actually going to be imaging. Because what I'm finding is by doing three point polar alignment on Polaris or in the region of Polaris, when I then shift my position to another area, for some reason that three point polar alignment routine doesn't tend to stick. And then I find myself having to do it again later on in the imaging session anyway. If you've got some similar experiences with three-point polar alignment in Nina, please let me know. But I did go and have a look on the forums and I could see some other people were struggling with it. One of the things I've learned, however, is if you're doing polar alignment and adjusting your azalt knobs on something like a HEQ5, make sure that at the end you do tighten those knobs. Expect it to shift by about a minute and always make sure that you finish your alt adjustment with a move up knob input not a move down and that will try and clear any back backlash. I read that in the Pegasus handbook. So there you have it to summarize in someone else's boat, we've gone through the four layers of the onion that affect us in astrophotography, some of which we have more control over than others. Those layers being space, Earth's atmosphere, our own equipment, and then ourselves. One last piece of advice I would like to give you from what I've learned during the last five or six months doing this is that strategy is important. 
it's easy to just get caught up and excited, particularly when you don't get a lot of clear nights. That, oh, it's a clear night, great, I'm just going to do what I've always done and just get stuck in. And then what happens is you tend to repeat old mistakes. Put a little bit of time into thinking about what's gone wrong in your previous imaging sessions. Come up with a simple strategy. Try and minimize the complexity in your imaging session. If you are mono imaging, just do one filter per night at the start. Sure, later on, play around with offsets, but be prepared that when you move to something like filter offsets, if you're not using parfocal filters, you are introducing some extra issues there that you're going to need to contend with. You will potentially be losing additional imaging time to autofocus routines. This hobby is already complicated enough. And as I've pointed out today, you have things that are working against you at every single level. And every time you have to bin a three minute or five minute sub and that accumulates across your imaging sessions, that's time lost. You can't get that back. Whereas if you'd have taken a more simple approach, maybe you wouldn't have had to have been those subs in the first place. I hope that's helpful. I'll see you on the next one. We mistakenly believe that true happiness lies in the acquisition of material wealth or the fulfillment of societal expectations. However, in our relentless pursuit, we often neglect the most vital aspect of our being, our own inner peace. So what does it mean to find our own inner peace? It is not a state of perpetual bliss or a complete absence of challenges and difficulties. Rather, it is a profound sense of tranquility and contentment that arises from within, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. It is the ability to navigate life storms with grace and serenity, rooted in the unwavering knowledge of our own inherent worth and interconnectedness with all of existence. When we cultivate inner peace, we radiate a profound energy that touches the lives of those around us. We become beacons of light, illuminating the paths of others who may be lost in the darkness of their own struggles.